Welcome back. Today we're going to be covering hemodynamic monitoring. Hemodynamic monitoring is simply the study of how blood moves through the heart. And when you take your patient's vital signs, essentially you're doing non-invasive hemodynamic monitoring. However, if you're we're dealing with a really sick patient, sometimes that's not enough. For example, the diagnosis may be unclear. There's various forms of shock, various forms of heart failure, and it's necessary to determine the actual underlying cause in order to guide treatment. And so what we can do is use an invasive technique called the pulmonary artery catheter, better known as a Swangans, and this is just like a central line that's going to be inserted and placed into the pulmonary artery, and it allows us to obtain pressure measurements from various specific regions of the heart during specific times that'll help guide the clinician into determining the diagnosis and manage the problem. Now, if a patient is sick enough to warrant invasive hemodynamic monitoring with the use of a swan gans, what's really going on is that we need to have the answers to the following questions. Do we need to give fluids? Perhaps maybe the patient would benefit from diuretics. Do we need to give inotropes, vasopressors, or maybe they need vasodilators? And so obtaining specific hemodynamic parameters will help answer those questions and guide the treatment for the patient. So before we go any deeper into pulmonary artery catheters, let's just talk about what goes on when you take a blood pressure by manual means. You're just measuring the cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance. So what is systemic vascular resistance? Well, that's the resistance that the left ventricle must work against in order to eject its stroke volume. And that's really based on the distensibility or compressibility of the arterial beds. So as you can see, I have this picture here. So if your arteries are clamped down very tight, the left ventricle has to work against a force to get the blood out to the body in order to perfuse the tissues. So if your left ventricle is working hard against a force, it's like any other muscle. And what happens is it'll eventually become enlarged. And so one of the things that we do to manage that, and this these conditions can occur in hypertension, um, fluid overload. These are some, some reasons why you would have clamped down vessels. And so what we can do is give vasodilators. And vasodilators will actually um, improve cardiac output because systemic uh, vascular resistance has an inverse relationship to cardiac output. So if your systemic vascular resistance is high, your cardiac output is going to be low. And if you can get your cardiac output up higher, it's usually because you've reduced your systemic vascular resistance in, in many cases. So when you take a blood pressure and you have your systolic and diastolic numbers, what you can do is determine the mean arterial pressure. And the mean arterial pressure is calculated by just taking two times your diastolic blood pressure plus your systolic blood pressure divided by three. And you need to have a map of greater than 60 in order to perfuse vital organs. And so what your mean arterial pressure, where it's really measuring is in the aorta. And it's giving you an average blood pressure that's going on during one cardiac cycle. Okay, let's talk about some of the parameters that we're going to be using when we look at a patient that has a swine gans in place and we're looking at our parameters and numbers and things that we're going to use to collect our information to determine what's going on and what's the best treatment plan. So cardiac output. Cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped by the heart per minute. And the equation for cardiac output is just simply heart rate times stroke volume. A normal cardiac output is four to eight liters per minute. The problem with just following a cardiac output is that if I weigh 80 pounds, my cardiac output may not be the same as someone who weighs 300 pounds. 
So what we have is a, a parameter called the cardiac index that normalizes for body weight. And so it's just cardiac output per body surface area. And your monitors, your cardiac monitors in the unit are, are out on the floor, has the capability of determining. You just need to use the height and weight, key it in, and it'll convert your cardiac output into a cardiac index. So your car, a normal cardiac index for an adult is between 2.5 to 4.0 liters per minute per millimeter squared. Another parameter that's important for you to understand is the ejection fraction. The ejection fraction is the percentage of ventricular chamber emptying. So it's the amount of blood ejected per total volume. And this is going to normally be between 50 to 75 percent or 65 percent. Is, is typically normal. So remember that when the left ventricle ejects blood into the systemic circulation, some of it is supposed to be left behind. And the most, you're going to use an echo, is going to be your most um, likely mechanism to determine ejection fraction. Stroke volume, that's the amount of blood ejected per ventricular contraction. So it's you know, the amount of blood per beat. So normal, the normal value is 60 to 120 milliliters per beat. Okay, and so we'll also normalize that for body weight as well. So we'll look at stroke volume indexes. So the stroke volume per body surface area. And, and the same way we would normalize a cardiac index. Okay, so this is exactly what a Swan-Gans catheter looks like. And it's very important to remember um, when you are assisting a physician with placing a Swan-Gans catheter, th there's a lot of complications that can occur during this process. And so it's very important that you're knowledgeable about the specific steps and um, things that would maintain safety for your patient. One of the most important things to know is that you would never inflate the balloon greater than for longer than 15 seconds um, because as you can see over here when you do you're basically causing an occlusion and just like a coronary artery can become occluded with um, plaque and result in, in an infarction you get the same thing in the pulmonary capillary beds if you leave the balloon inflated too long and so also you could rupture the balloon and cause damage inside the heart. So you would never inflate the balloon with more than 1.5 milliliters of air. And each Swan-Gans catheter comes with its own syringe and you use only that syringe when um, getting measurements or, um, you know, with assisting with the insertion. You're, you're not going to put another syringe from somewhere else. You're only going to use the syringe that came with the kit. So what typically happens is that the physician decides that a patient needs a pulmonary artery catheter and most likely he's going to go through the internal jugular vein to um, what they call floating in the catheter. And that's because that particular site location gives a straight shot into um, the right atrium. And so as the catheter is placed, just like any other central line or triple lumen catheter would be, except it's going, the difference is it's going to be advanced into the right atrium. And when the physician sees this waveform, the right atrial pressure waveform on the monitor, you'll need to, or you'll need to be able to identify that because he'll be inserting the catheter. You'll be, you, as the nurse, you'll need to watch and be able to identify this waveform. So when you see this waveform, let the physician know and take note of the pressure reading because you're getting your initial numbers and this is going to be your baseline during the insertion of a Swan-Gans catheter. So at this point, the physician is probably going to ask you to inflate the balloon. The reason he's going to want the balloon to be inflated is because he's that's going to help drive the catheter through the rest of the chambers of the heart into the pulmonary artery. It's going to float itself in. It's going to, it's going to be like a guide. It's going to, just going to help get the catheter where it needs to be. So he'll, he'll ask you to inflate the balloon. When you do so, do it with slow, steady, consistent 
you know, consistent um, pressure on the syringe. What you may not necessarily need 1.5 milliliters of air. Possibly one milliliter is going to be enough to get the swan to, to move along. And so soon after, you're going to see this particular waveform. And this is when the catheter has entered into the right ventricle. It is very common to see um, PVCs, ectopy, because when the catheter crosses into the right ventricle, the right ventricle is very um, hypersensitive to foreign objects and, and it will send, you will see dysrhythmias. So you must be prepare, prepared ahead of time, have a crash cart available and be prepared um, for, um, you know, possibly VTAC could occur. Maybe, they, maybe they'll lose their pulse. So you have to be ready in case that situation occurs. And so once the catheter gets in, out of the out of the right ventricle, you're going to identify this waveform and write down that pressure. Then you're going to go to the pulmonary, it's going to enter into the pulmonary artery and the waveform is going to look like this. And so, um, but what you're going to do is you're going to, you're not going to see this until you have the balloon already inflated. So what you'll eventually see, you'll see the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure first because that's when the physician is going to know he's in the right place. And so what you're going to, what you're going to do when you see this waveform, you're going to let the physician know you have a wedge pressure reading and that you have this waveform right down the particular pressure that you see. And at that point, he's going to, he's going to ask you to deflate the balloon. And in order to deflate the balloon, you just let go of the syringe and let it passively deflate. You never want to pull back on the syringe because that can rupture, that can cause damage to the integrity of the catheter. And so, He'll pull back the catheter just a little bit and, and then you're going to look for the pulmonary artery pressure waveform. And this is where the catheter should be placed when we're not shooting numbers or not trying to get a pulmonary catheter, catheter wedge pressure. This is where the catheter should be. And so this is when you walk into a patient's room after the pulmonary artery catheter is placed. This is, this is what you want to see on the monitor. Okay. And so, most likely what will happen is the physician will ask you again to inflate the balloon just to make sure that it's positioned to where if we want to obtain a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, it'll, it'll wedge. So generally what will happen is you're going to repeat the process. You're going to inflate, you're going to get back the pulmonary capillary wedge reading, and you're going to let the balloon passively deflate when the physician tells you so. So then what's going to happen is he's going to order a chest x-ray and placement will be confirmed with a chest x-ray prior to using the catheter for any reason. So, so as you noticed, as the catheter moved through the right side of the heart, we were able to get direct measurements. We could directly record the right atrial pressure, right ventricular pressure, pulmonary artery pressure. What happens when we perform the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure maneuver by inflating the balloon, what we're doing is getting an indirect measurement of the left side of the heart's pressure. And we can make that leap of faith that that's what we're reading if our mitral valve is okay. So if the mitral valve is functioning normally, it's not stenotic, not regurgitant, that the capillary wedge pressure there would be no obstruction between the left ventricle back into the pulmonary capillaries. So the pressure sensor is going to be essentially reading what the accurate pressure would be in the left ventricle at end diastole. So you're going to obtain the reading during um, end diastolic reading. So you're looking for a left ventricular end diastolic measurement. 